Hi, I'm Ekaterina from the Future London Academy and today we have a special treat for you. We will be visiting the house of the legendary Michael Wolf, the founder of Wolf Orleans, creative designer, thinker and my very good friend. We'll talk about the world of branding, the early days of Wolf Orleans and his life. So let's go. The first thing that I, I quite like people f having a sense of when they come in here is they can not only borrow an umbrella, but they can pick any colour they like. So what do we have here? We have a girl who um, is painted on a piece of hardboard, which is stitched together by a painter called Alan Baker. And I, and I love this fabric. I bought it because it looks like my daughter. I'll show you a picture of my, one of my daughters. She looks very much like that. And I love the look on her face, whether it's a... I can't quite tell whether she's smiling, whether she's like the woman in... Ki what's the thing? Killing Eve or something. Whether she's actually going to kill you. Or quite <laughs> what's going to happen. And I love this Peter Blake. Because that's a, a portrait by Peter Clark of Peter Blake. And I know Peter Blake, and that's exactly what he looks like. And he collects a bit. It's just the standing of it. It's completely Peter Blake. And there was a letter which, which the gallery owner never let me have, which was Peter Blake writing to Peter Clark saying, you got me. <laughs> it's a huge painting. It's quite, yeah, but it's such a weird painting. What, why did you buy it? Because it's weird. <laughs> because, um, because of the joke of the postcards. You know, I, I love the idea of painting a slightly messy um, scotch tape. Because it doesn't look as if it could... Why would somebody paint it? <laughs> and then we've got that one cartoon as we go down. This is a guy called Stan Hunt. It's actually like somebody looking at climate change and thinking, what do you mean climate yeah. change? And uh, this is a wonderfully ignorant face. <laughs> I love his feet as well. Like, he, oh, what's that? And I actually like the expression the handwriting is on the wall because it is actually. If we don't do something about climate change, we're yeah. going to be in the soup. We're, we're already in the soup. soup. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about Wolf Orleans. Ah! Oh, that company there. I didn't expect that. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I want to talk about the stage one, stage two, or stage, stage three. zero. The best stage zero. How did it come about? What, when did? You, how did it start? Okay, okay. Well, I was um, drifting from one job to another. I was designing light fittings with one company, then designing nightclubs with another company, then designing exhibition stands with another company, and 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 eventually, um, I met this guy who said. Uh, I run a whole series of magazines, would you like to design the covers? And I said, yes. Well, would you start with the muck shifter and spreader? It's a, a magazine for farmers. It looked terrible. And I then had a friend who was a typographer and he said, oh, you want to use Cooper Black because it looks like cow shit. It's wet. <laughs> and, uh, so I did muck shifter and spreader in letter set. It, it looked absolutely wonderful. And that was the start of me getting interested in graphic design because it suddenly looked like the Muck Shifter and Spreader magazine. And in that moment, I realized if I can make people look like what they are, that would be much better than making them look like how I would like them to look. So that that stayed with me ever since then, actually. And um, so I did these magazine covers and then one day I got a call from a guy called James Main. I'd never heard of him. Uh, he had a little design company in Highgate and he said, I know you worked in the BBC and I saw what you did and you worked for a company called Crawford's and I saw all your exhibition stands and I'm moving my company from Highgate. I bought a little house, at least a little house in Parkway, Camden Town. Um, would you come and join me? 
and I thought this is absolutely wonderful because I was working from home and not knowing anything about fees and I mean you couldn't find a worse business person than me I mean not completely pitiful useless so anyway um, he had uh, uh, what's the word converted this house he had a team of about four people and he insisted on calling the company Maine Wolf because he thought it would be good and that I was just beginning to be known for exhibition stands. So it had my name. He, we got paid the same. I didn't own it. He owned it with his wife. But everything, we, we went and bought suits together. We got paid the same money. And I realized that I was probably better at persuading clients to give us work that, than he was. So we trundled along. It was mainly work that he'd brought with him. And I thought, I've got a proper job. This is really good. I really enjoyed it. And then he said, um, you know, my kids go to a school in Highgate. And one of them is called Rufus Olins. And his dad is uh, runs a design company. And I think his dad's quite interesting. I'd quite like you to meet him. So I went to this dreadful design company called Caps, which was pretty much a printing company. And uh, I met Wally. And, um, what did you think of him when you met him? Well, I thought he was a grown-up. That was the first thing. So that was good. And then he said, look, I'll be honest with you. The creative director of this company is obsessed with international paper sizes. And that's about it. And he's called Ernest Hock. And he was quite a well-known typographer. And he said, your work is about finding the personality of a company and, and, and giving them what they would give themselves if they knew how to do it. And I said, yeah, that's, that's exactly how I see it. So he said, well, look, I'm, I'm leaving this place and why, I, I'm going to help you get some clients. So, and he wrote some letters which I thought were wonderful. They were terrible, actually. But I thought they were wonderful because they were grown-up letters. And as a result, we started to see people. Then he joined Gears and Gross the American advertising company, couple. They became Gears Gross Olins and they got fed up with him after six weeks and he got sacked. So he then came around to see us and got on very well with our company secretary who had come to us by mistake. I'd hired a secretary uh, from the design council and the morning she was supposed to turn up, Jane turned up and said, Jenny, she thought it was too far for her to come to Camden Town from the King's Road. So she asked me if I'd like to take the job. And I said, fine. <laughs> so we hired Jane. Jane and Wally immediately um, leapt into some sort of bizarre affair. I don't know. I, know. I never, ever knew when these things were going on in the company. <laughs> I never, everybody knew except me. Anyway, they got on very well. And it was actually very useful because Jane was sort of Miss Moneypenny. And Wally was very good at charging fees. I was always, no, no, we won't charge you anything. It would be a pleasure to do it, which I'm still a bit like that. But they were, they were terrific. And um, off we went. And then James got fed up uh, with being upstaged by Wally. And he wanted to be an inventor anyway and was sort of inventing things and inflicting his inventions on us <coughs> and inflicting his inventor colleagues on us. One of them was extraordinary man called Derek Hodgkinson who invented a packaging system based on cardboard which was pre-scored so it could be folded to any size and we sold it to Douglas Fairbanks <laughs> this is a mad thing who had a, a, a licensing company and we got 1500 quid each for it <laughs> which is more money than I've ever seen in my life and I bought four bicycles for the, the four kids that I was raising then um, and so Derek left and Wally and I went on to sort of build, gradually build more furnace. That's how it started. So when you decided that it's two of you, did you hire anyone first? It was just two of you. No, we, we had the, the remains of, the, of mm -hmm. James's company. So we had about five or six people. Mm -hmm. And then we gradually got bigger projects and we hired people and hired people and hired people from DRU and from other design companies and all the rest of it. And then we moved to Duke's Road and we got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, then I left when we were in Duke's Road. Um, and then they got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger.
and now I think that Brian has just left uh, Brian Boylan so now they are rudderless I think I don't know what they're going to do do you remember the first project that you did together with Wooly yeah what was it it was English electric uh, Leo English electric computers yeah. what was special about that project well I'll tell you the story of um, um, the, the <laughs> it's a really mad story we, literally there was a ring on the door and I went downstairs and I opened the door and there was this very hot and um, bothered looking man with a terrible limp and he said good afternoon um, I'm David Kamala and I'm from English Electric Leo Marconi Computers and I've been sent by the Design Council well it had been organized but Jane hadn't told me so he wasn't just walking in from the street and I, but she hadn't told me. So I said, well, um, it's good to meet you. Come in. We were in this tiny house and we had to climb about three stories. And he fell on the stairs and had a wooden leg. So he ended up looking like a cat with the, you know, when a cat has its one leg sticking up, he ended up looking like a cat with this thing. And we went to help him. Don't, don't help me, don't help me, don't help me. So, okay, we stood by. He managed to get himself up. We went upstairs sat down he was hot and bothered and we were oh god this isn't really going very well and then he said um he said uh why i'm here he said only three things sell computers you know he said i don't know why i'm here they sent me three things sell computers quality service price and i don't think that anything you do can affect the quality or the service of the price of our computers so I don't really know what I'm doing here. So I thought, oh God, I've got to rescue this somehow because Wally was on the edge of losing his temper because he, he was quite ferocious. So I thought, well, I'll call him by his first name. I'll get him in a conversation. And my mind was spinning like crazy and I had an idea. So I said, David, I paused a bit, just David. And I watched him just calm down a little bit from his rage and I said what car do you drive and he went what do you mean and I said I mean what car do you drive and he looked at me as if I was mad and then started thinking and then looked at me as if he'd had some amazing realization and he said it's a really interesting question he said I drive a Jaguar he said uh, the quality is terrible there is no service and the price is exorbitant so I said well why do you drive it and he said well I drive it because I love it so I said well look we can't help people to love your company but we can certainly help to pr you to express yourself in a way that people will notice and like you and he said well I'll stay a bit longer let's let's see what <laughs> let's see if we can get a project off the ground and um, we did and uh, he was always suspicious of us we, we did I mean actually fantastic work for him because it didn't look like design it was about information and he always wanted to slightly punish Wally for being brilliant and he would say um, he would call Wally up and say you're fired and uh, Wally would immediately say well hang on David I'm coming round and then uh, David Kamala would call me and say, it's all right, you're not fired. It's, it's the best way of getting Wally to come to a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and then Wally would, would arrive there. We worked for them for two or three years. Yeah, and it was... That's uh, an amazing story. But it, it didn't look like design. I think you always have the ability to explain design to people who don't understand yes. the value of brand or design yes. or yeah. and yeah. creativity in general. Yeah. No, I think I do. And, um, well, I think most people don't realize that a brand is a result of how you behave and how you look. And then other people will invent their feeling about you based on the hints that you've given them. You know, you don't necessarily believe their advertising or believe anything, but you invent them and they give you the fuel. And that's how a brand gets born. And most designers think they make brands, but they don't. They, they make what creates, what plays a part in creating a brand. Wolf Orleans was also quite ahead of its time yeah. because of your minds and how yeah. you saw things and yeah. things that now 
branding companies are talking about, you were talking about ages ago. Yes, yes. And I think one thing that uh, I love how you talk about Wolf Orleans was about the culture and the cultural yeah. food and yeah. everything that was happening was more than just design. Yeah. What was the, the whole food situation and why did you think it was important? Well, because I thought that, um, I thought that brands are created by people who notice things and therefore noticing is, is absolutely fundamental to design. You know, noticing how things don't work, noticing how things could be better, noticing bad writing, noticing stupid processes. And so um, I always operated from noticing what was there and asking myself, is this serving this company to establish itself in the minds of other people? And even with English Electric, they used to serve orange squash, uh, orange concentrate. And you know that one of their competitors was uh, was uh, IBM, who were extremely civilized and cultured, and uh, well, a, a very well organized company. And English Electric were pathetic; they didn't even know how to collect somebody from the state. You know, they didn't; they had no consciousness of how you make people feel at home, or how you make people feel good, or how you impress people. They were sort of basically science-based people. And they, they didn't really understand selling. So we coaxed them and taught them, and in that process taught ourselves. Because, you know, I, I think, well, how do we treat people? And <coughs> how do we treat our own people? And I thought, well, we treat them much like other people treat them, and that's not really good enough. How, how can we create a culture that people will want to come and work for us? So that's how the, the food thing started. And, and I thought, how do I take food to to the epitome of what it should be? And I'd already um, met Terence Conran and already was an admirer of his his sort of world and how he did things. So I got hold of his chef, Charles Campbell, and I said, Charles, I want people to notice our food. So... Um, how do we do that? And he said, you just have always have delicious things. So how do we do that? Well, he said, I will, um, it's going to cost you some money because it take a lot of time. I said, fine, what will you do? He said, I will tell you what tastes good all the way through the year because it changes and where to get it. So we had this, um, I've lost it, unfortunately. We had this amazing list of producers, providers, shops. So the, for example, our eggs were Moran eggs. I didn't even know what they were. They came from a, a farm in near Reading. They were dark brown. The yolks were orange. Um, my secretary knew how to scramble eggs beautifully. So, and we made our own bread. So from a kickoff, you got the best scrambled eggs on toast that you could get anywhere in London, just straight away. And then these apples, and then it was it was about discernment. And in a funny kind of way, I saw food as a metaphor for discernment in how our work looked. You know, I hate saying you know, um, how language should be. And uh, I started to get very interested in language and in service. And uh, I'm now going to jump a generation. I remember when we worked for 3i, we had a client called John Foles. This is just a really nice little story. I, I was in his room on the f 10th floor, slightly thinking, why do senior people always go to the top of the building? But, uh, but, never mind, they were there. And I said, John, what happens when somebody comes to see you? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, what happens when people come to see you? Um, I send Elizabeth down to collect them. I see. And does she walk beside them, in front of them, or behind them? He said, I've got no idea. Does it make any difference? And I said, OK, let's go to the door of your office, and we're going to walk in three times. And we're going to walk in with me in front of you, me behind you, and me beside you. All right. So we do it three times. And I, he said, which felt better? Oh, he said, walking beside you felt better. So I said, well, you could ask Elizabeth what she does and maybe suggest that she walks beside people. 
He said, I, I don't really want to tell Elizabeth what to do because I trust her natural courtesy. And I said, well, hold on a minute. How many visitors do you get a day? He said, sometimes none. He said, sometimes ten of them. And no, he said, I would say an average three. I said, well, why don't you go down and collect them? Because if a CEO comes down to meet you, it feels really good. It feels like you're really important. And he said, yeah, that's, that's what I'll do. So this is just a tiny story of waking people up to where they play their part in how other people feel and that other people will take that away as a story and it will help them to appreciate you. And that that's always there for me. I'm always sort of, how do you greet people? And uh, and never, never have a leaflet rack. Always give people a leaflet if you want them to read it because if they just take it, they'll probably throw it away and you're wasting your money. I mean, they won't all throw it away, but many of them will. And so I've always sort of felt that all design is service design. Um, there isn't any design that isn't service design, that isn't helping people to feel better or attracted or interested or engaged in some way. And um, that stuck with me. Was there anything that went wrong ever while you were in the company? Some, um, something that didn't go according to the plan? Yes. <laughs> I just have to try and think of them. Oh, God, there was one wonderful thing that went wrong, which was, it wasn't our fault. We designed a symbol for a machine tool company. And it was a wonderful spiral that one of our people drew. It was really beautiful. And it, we took it into this guy and he said, but that's the wool mark. You're just showing me the wool mark. It wasn't the wool mark, but he thought it was. And he just went, get out. <laughs> get out. I thought, okay. So we packed up the projector and took the slice. And one and I, we went down in the elevator. And there was a program on the on the radio called, uh, it was Peter Ustinov and somebody else. And they were, it was a program about a couple of second-hand car salesmen. And at the end of every program, one of them said to the other, run for it, Maury. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so one of just said, run for it, Maury, as we were in the lift. And that was, that was probably the biggest time that something went wrong went wrong. I well, know there's another story when something went very wrong indeed. Um, we were called up by a, a, a company called Koenig's Pilsner. You must know this story. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they'd seen that we'd done a restaurant, designed a restaurant for Lions, and they were a brewery and they wanted to get into bars and restaurants and they thought we were the right people. So I took a, a presentation that uh, somebody prepared for me. We had a German rep who Wally was very suspicious of. He just thought he drove around in a BMW and didn't do anything, which was probably true. But anyway, we arrived, and there was this room of identical German blonde business people. Short hair, pale grey suits, looking very, you know, I used to think they, they got no dandruff and they don't need their heels replaced on their shoes, they're immaculate Germans. And um, Wolfgang did a 30-minute presentation in German, I didn't understand a word of it. So I stood there getting really frustrated. I'm really frustrated, and sort of think, oh, what the fuck am I doing here? And he gets to the end, and I said, Wolfgang, I didn't understand a word of that. He said, it doesn't matter. The owners are just coming. These are just the middle managers. You don't have to worry about them. So the door opens and two more blondes come in, a man and a woman, <laughs> both, in, both with short blonde hair, both in grey suits. And he comes up to me and he clicks his heels and he says, uh, Koenig, I shake hands, all that. And then they go and join their colleagues all the Venetian blinds come down. The room is plunged into darkness. I switch on the projector and there's a picture of me with Susie, my wife, drinking champagne on the side of a Norwegian fjord. I go, oh, um, you know, we have one bloke in the company who always plays a practical joke with our slides. I'm really sorry. I set the projector to automatic. Peter had given me my holiday snaps. So I had to sit there for about 15 minutes while they had, I mean, they couldn't quite understand what was going on. <laughs> and it was my holiday pictures. And then Koenig came up to me. It was actually quite cool. 
And he said, thank you very much, Mr. Wolf. Goodbye. <laughs> and we took our projector and left. But it was hysterical. Did they come back to you? No, 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 no. That was <laughs> it. <laughs> Did Wally get really upset? No, he thought it was quite funny. And it was, it was quite funny. <laughs> Well, apart from your fascination with food, another thing that you always appreciated was fashion, and is fashion still. Yeah. And you were known uh, for interesting outfits that you would really like. Yes. That not necessarily everyone would understand. No. Um, what? Well, I wore overalls for seven years. What was? Zip the, up the front. Yeah. <laughs> I wore them for and clogs. What was your, I suppose, most outrageous outfit that? The overalls. Overalls. Because I had white ones, black ones, khaki ones, and blue ones. And when I went to VW, they thought I was somebody coming from the factory, and they sort of <laughs> quickly try and get me out of the building. And I had to be rescued by a VW board member. He said, "No, no, it's all right. It's, it's, it's okay. It's, okay. It's, it's Michael Wolf from Wolf Owens." It's, it's. <laughs> but I, 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 it was a very eccentric thing. I just liked the idea of having one set of clothes that you put in the washing machine dried and you could wear the next day and I just thought oh, it's, it's, for me I thought it's the end of clothes of course it wasn't but it was so simple what's uh, your favorite outfit now I'm wearing it <laughs> yeah I mean I, I I think jeans were as an amazing invention do you think designers need to express themselves through fashion or like, because some there is, do there yeah. is this thing about architects wear black or designers need to look creative yeah I don't know what that's all about I mean I, I have worn black suits but uh, I, I, don't, I, I just prefer to be comfortable and when I've got a tie on I never feel comfortable because oops I'm probably making booming noises um, <laughs> I just I, I don't I just don't quite get it I mean I used to sometimes put on the whole suit business and I used to think it feels all right but it doesn't anymore so I, I will do it if I'm going to meet um, no it's not true I met the Lord Chief Justice or whatever he's called I did put a suit on for him but not a tie <laughs> that's the furthest you can go with yes yeah, the furthest I can go open shirt and well cut suit but no ties I've seen you wearing blue Uggs as well Blue Uggs, the 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 shoes, the blue, bright blue. Oh, blue cloth. Yes, yes, blue. Uh, um, what are they called? Uggs. Yes. Yeah. I wear blue shoes occasionally. That's, that was nice. I yeah. Think but I get less. I mean, I wear these. These are these are. Uh, what are they called? Australian. I don't know what they're called. Maybe they're Uggs. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, they are. I yeah, I, I wear them the shoes. whole time. Nice. I mean, I'm, I'm much less bothered with clothes. It's age thing can't be bothered with it I will do sometimes <laughs> yeah but I think you still have the appreciation for the color you yeah would, you could wear something black but with a bright scarf or oh, socks the or Mickey, Mickey Mouse t-shirt yeah yeah, yeah. I'll, I will do that I just like I just like something that makes you feel you you're there um, you know, I was in the army. I, uh, that's another story how I got out of that but I spent six months in the army that was awful Oh God, dreadful! Yeah. Oh, even thinking about it, the food was disgusting. The people shouting and screaming at you. Oh God! It's the mm. opposite of creativity and. Uh... Oh. Yeah, but I got out. I think it was quite quite clever means of getting out. What did you do? I um, there were lots of people who who played the misfit thing, mm -hmm. and they were spotted and really treated with great cruelty. So I thought, well, I've got to do the misfit thing, but I've got to do it much better. And I did it much more extremely. So I would do things like, because I knew what they were like, so I would walk off parade, literally walk off. And you'd, somebody would shout at you, of course, and they'd shout at you again, you'd just keep walking. They wouldn't run after you because it wasn't dignified. <laughs> so they only had certain things that they could do and if you broke through that, they were—they just didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> so they just put up with me, really. And I, I just, you know, things like they come come in the in the room where we were all sleeping with a broomstick at six in the morning, rattle it around in a bucket. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! 
and I would stay in bed and he'd come up to me, what's the matter with you? And I'd say, Sergeant, I, I've got a really terrible headache, please don't shout at me. <laughs> uh, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> be, be shut up and get, get out of bed, you lazy bastard or something. I'd say, look, please don't. I, honestly, I've got a terrible headache. <laughs> So when you behave to them like a human being and not like a, an automatic response, they, you touch the human being in them and they don't quite follow through until <laughs> I was doing this for about a month. <clears throat> On one occasion, I was, I was in the, a, a clerk in an office and, the, and it's the sergeant major's office and the phone rings and I pick up the phone and I say, this is the regimental sergeant major. And the voice at the other end says, this is the regimental sergeant major. You stay exactly where you are, soldier. So I'm paralyzed because he's a pretty frightening bloke. And I hear him walking on the duckboards, the wood outside, and he comes in. And he says, what, what do you think you're doing? And I said, I'm really sorry. I was just a bit of sense of humor. He said, it's, it's, you were insolent, and I'm putting you under arrest. You're going to report to the commanding officer. So I get marched in. They, they march you between two soldiers, like a, you know. So I go in front of the, the, uh, the um, commanding officer. Poor man, he's looking after national service clerks who are typists. And, I mean, it's an awful job. So he says... Um, I understand you did this, and I said, yes, and I understand you make spelling mistakes. Yeah, I, did, I have made some spelling mistakes. Do you realize a spelling mistake in a time of war could cause the death of a soldier? And I said, oh, come on, Major Payne, be reasonable. I sort of, you know, come on. And he went, the, the color of your top, I mean, he went, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. Place this man under close arrest, pending court martial for insubordination and insolence. And I was brrr, marched across the parade ground, slapped into the um, sort of prison, hair shaved off, and uh, locked in a cell. I don't know what's going to happen now. And the, but the regimental police actually were funny, nice, nice reg regular soldiers. They thought it was really funny. <laughs> And they, they gave me food. I mean, they treated me like a human being. Uh, they let me out of the prison, and we had dinner and played cards and stuff like that. And they said, well, you know, you know, I don't think they're going to court-martial you, but they, um, an officer is going to come, and you'll probably get a reprimand, but you've got to see this officer. So I get all dressed up with a berry and polish the buttons and polish my boots. I go and see this officer, who's half my age, you know. And he says, um, Private Wolf, are you, um, do you think the army is harming you? And I said, no, 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 I don't like it. I mean, I'd rather not be here, but I don't think it's doing me any harm. <clears throat> and he looked at me with a slight twinkle in his eye and said, but you're beginning to harm the army. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, I hope not. He said, well, I don't think you're suited for this kind of life. I'm going to recommend you for a discharge. And he put down incipient schizophrenic in, on the card, which I kept. And I was out within about, uh, I was out within three weeks. Wow. Yeah. And my, my dad was ashamed. <laughs> but you're such a rebel. You've always been a rebel. And Probably. And I think that's, that's yeah. you just can't. Can't help it. Yeah. Well... <laughs> I think we could spend like the whole day talking. So for for today, uh, close the subject. Yeah, let's let's finish with the, just a bit of a branding talk for current designers and people who work in branding, graphic design, any sort of design. What do you think? What kind of qualities does a design leader, someone who wants to build a great agency, a great okay. company, what does he need to or okay. she needs to have? Okay. It's a really a, a good question. It's one I know how to answer. Um, the most important thing you have is your imagination. And if you don't nourish your imagination in some way, it will not serve you. It will keep giving you the same ideas, thinking that it can get away with it. So you, <laughs> you have to treat your imagination quite severely. And I would say the two things that nourish imagination is one is noticing. And um, there's a book there with two eyes on it. It's a, yeah, I haven't read it yet, but it's a book on noticing. But I mean, 
obsessive noticing you know like you do when you come in here and you 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 see things that are not familiar to you or you notice a book or you notice uh, what the hell is that parent doing or whatever what, what, whatever so it's and it's mainly a question of noticing things that don't quite work well enough like somebody with a walking stick trying to get on a train because um the door isn't the same level as the platform in France I'm talking about now whatever you you just notice things that don't really work and the other thing is your ability to put yourself in other people's shoes and if if you can do those two things then your imagination is fed reasonably well so for example we pitched for the Harrods account and we had a writer working for us called Terence Griffin who was absolutely amazing and um because he was a fantastic noticer <clears throat> and a great appreciator and we were competing with a company called Minnelli Tattersfield who won but they did it by changing the Harrods logo type and what Terence did was start writing almost a novel that ran through all their packaging so the biscuit tin would say well four people came to Aunt Tabitha's tea party that afternoon and he, he writes about a wonderful tea party well that's a beautiful thing on a tin of biscuits they didn't get it i got it and and i thought this is a breakthrough and that's what i mean if you don't have your imagination you won't think why don't we write a novel on their cans or why don't we have everything be in a different color or or why don't we uh have um all the board on the ground floor and the people who print on the top floor why why can't we do it differently and i think why can't we do it differently without driving people mad if it's based on noticing so that differently is always better and if it isn't based on um being in other people's shoes he will enjoy that or she will enjoy that that's make a better life for her and it tips you into service design well service design is based on imagination it says how could this be why am i giving people a boarding pass and a ticket why can't they be one thing i mean that's maybe a stupid example but there are so many examples in life where you think i'll, I'll give you a, a good one there was a um a, a, a gp practice quite near here and they had a corridor opposite the window with the reception with about six chairs and then they had a waiting room the people in the waiting room thought the people on the chairs near reception were getting in first and the people on the chairs opposite reception they thought the people in the waiting room were getting in first <laughs> so you got two lots of frustrated pissed off people and so we said well you need something like a, a an, an airport a very simple version of an airport thing where people see their name going up and they won't be worried about being other people jumping the queue oh thank you very much um who do we go to for that well we'll we'll find a company that can do it for you and, and I, mean, i was just a patient i wasn't working for them <laughs> but you know all the time you see things that could be easier for people and i i think noticing is what i would recommend to anybody thinking about design don't worry about your creativity worry about your noticing and and drive it up to a pitch where you're doing it all the time why camera's black you know uh, why 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 <laughs> amazing well i think yeah. that's the best advice yeah. and uh we'll finish on this for today but there will have many more of these conversations I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks a lot everyone for watching or listening wherever thank you camera thank you both of you <laughs> and um, thanks amazing team behind the, the cameras <laughs> yeah. um if guys who are watching or listening to this uh guys and girls have any questions comment ask questions what shall we talk about next time with michael we have so many more interesting discussions yeah. um and would love to hear your feedback and opinions if you're watching it on youtube subscribe to hear the next conversation with michael and if you're listening to it on a podcast also subscribe and leave a review, leave a review. that always helps us and Thank and buy so my much. books when I finally publish them. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, absolutely. Well, we'll talk about your books next time. Yeah, okay. That would be very interesting. Yeah, okay. um, and thanks a lot. Uh, and thank you, Mike. Thank you, Ekaterina. It's always a pleasure. Amazing. Uh, thanks. Until next time. Well. <laughs> <laughs>
Done. Done. Done and dusted. Done and dusted.